Exposed, Navigating a Women's Prison by Tamikia Johnson. Shuffling in and out of groups called Cage Your Rage, Grief Share, Scripting Your Life. I can scream you into the direction of a fire to have you burn with me. Or I can whisper above a wind's breath and share my experiences. Help you navigate a women's prison like a man navigates his barbershop. Barely private, mostly exposed, a lot of both isms sharing one space. Cinder blocks juxtaposed with gardens observed from bars that have windows. The number of years served etched into the bricks with blood, tears, and grimaces. Loud silence, passive aggressive bullies, teenagers and silver foxes, immaturity, arrested development, innocent, guilty, wrongfully convicted, and cold cases that caught up. Bricked up minds finding solace, going to beaches, their children's eyes, grandmother's bosom, where they are not broken. But returning to the reality of monkeys fighting with inmates over happy cards, face laced with fentanyl, angry words flying, fists exchanging, leaking faces from brown colored cudgel cups, teeth knocked out, hands broken, and ear bitten off and flushed down the toilet. But the sun rises again. The geese flock on the yard, chasing down inmates and table food. Drunk hummingbirds sit long from the nectar. A smile that says, God bless you, walking by. Pooch wafting in the air, lingering sense of homelessness. Laughter at jokes with no punchline. Artists prevailing words with affirmation on seven walls and eight sidewalks. Beds with shackles, padlocks, and chains. Hearts interwoven in a common goal. Shuffling in and out of buses, destined a sack to prison or home forever. All right. Lovely Olson. This name, last name, Williams. Me and a dope A moment so impossible. You're a place so tropical. When the eyes close, and when the eyes away. And the truth is told of that the reality. When there's a downfall, you can turn up on me. As you see, this is me away. A place so tropical. Only if you know me. You know me better than the answer to me. It's yet. No face is needed. It's a day and night. You take it. At me highest and even at me weakest. Long cut too many to blade is me most needed. Loyalty over love, families were undefeated. He had a mad mouth, just like a daydream, so took it easy on me. In the end, I don't need to plead a hook, feel luck for Sunday, out of glass, emotions built like stones. But would you, let me a walk to me in the door. What me still outside, me could still out by. Me and the door is in space of pain and love, your curve. Impossible to impossible. Me and the door is in subco. Me away. Me both keep me safe place. Me eyes open to reality and face. Me and adult. Yes, me is yes. I love the ocean. That's me, William. The date is me, privacy. The bed, me bed, provides a leaf in the privacy. When no eyes cry for me. Me put the seat like a curtain so no one can see. Me escape. Me daily reality. The office is too set to clear. It's to the south and through the cut holes and the sour turn of this for a seat. You are the prison, cameras walk me. Me bumps to the left is the only side of you. No moving like it's ever unseen. By any means necessary, the unthinkable, to me anecdote, your x ray. Yes, me privacy. My bus said as an antidote, I see to your Johnson. I've been giving it some thought about how the only door I can open in prison is an invisible one leading to my bunk bed. It calls me when it wants and needs me. Sometimes it betrays my insomnia, giving me a few drips of sleep, even driving me crazy in my nightmares. Still, can't get enough of it like a toxic relationship providing for a tough ride where I confide my deepest secrets. 
a view of lazy, muddled clouds barely making sense hovering over barren land and indentured people. It's hard to block calls from the population, no matter how high the perch of my top bunk. People forget my weaknesses get ironed out up here, where I work out my salvation. It's my safe haven, a, pl a place I avoid danger and don't have to speak. I can daydream, meditate, and have visions. I look over, and I'm happy at my reflection in the mirror. Sometimes I don't want to come down. A new meaning of cold feet. Did I mention my blankets draw up? Obscure, balanced by a frame that keeps me stabilized, a mattress that aggravates my sciatic nerve, and a pillow that makes it hard to hide my neck pain. No matter the mistakes I make, my bed accepts me for who I am. It appreciates all I do. I can cry, moan, soak, or engage in inside sports like pity party, and my heart's torn to pieces. I could take off my clothes, drama, armor, problems, and drop my responsibilities to focus. Unlocking my day, examining my circle, reflecting on my overtime work, being all I can be. You can find me releasing regrets while maintaining good body language. God and I have late night conversations, intimate, but I can never get naked. So sleepy, can't sleep, and in hypervigilance, my bed makes time for it all. Chastity, no one has been here before. Saving it for the man of God's choosing. I count my blessings, pray for provision, keep to the feet, listen to God's voice, hold myself in the rain, create and express myself to all and everything that loves me. From the resemblance by Sydney Whalen, an old homemade wooden shelf in the backyard under the mango tree. Next to the chicken coop, Grandma grabs the jar again. In it, a single fruit, a noni, the floating juice. As long as I can remember, it's been there, never changing. My grandma's face never aging, not wrinkled with time, but from a grimace when she takes one sip and puts it back on that wooden shelf under the mango tree. And as I sip from the jar, I pop my locker, hope I know it's safe floating juice. I wonder, will I be never aging someday too? The last rock out of hell, Sydney Whalen. One, weighed down, I made through. Muddied water, shame, sweat, and silence. Shackled to the floor with bed, table, and chair are all I have to mitigate, to mediate the hell within my cell. With this hard, cold plastic, this raft, I stay afloat. So I can watch upon my dreamscape shore where heaven within hell awoke. Two, tired and alone, I cling to this hard, cold plastic to keep my head above the water, break the surface, and go past it. Withheld, within, without. But my body remains trapped, my soul knows no bounds. This is A Letter to My Bed by Chantel Jeanette Black. Dear Bed, the sun hasn't risen yet, and I already want to thank you before placing my feet on the cold stone ground. I slept well through the night, all things considered, for nothing else in the world could bring me such peace and solitude in this ominous place. At home, I used to take prayer showers in peace, though so now I play on me through the open spaces in the shower door. I can't even piss in peace to see my face and feet through that door, too. Part of my language, but it's just so knowing eyes are on me 24-7. I am utmost grateful for the illusion of privacy that you provide when I hang my sheet across your line. You have been my only resource for healing the abundance of scars within and without. It is only here where I can close my eyes and be the mother I was meant to be, where I can hold her again, laugh and play with my family. I can release all the tears felt from grief through the years. Time has no meaning other than knowing the world outside continues without me. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Museum of the African Diaspora. My name is Elizabeth Gessel, and I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the museum. 
And as we begin all of our programs, we like to ground ourselves in the spaces we are occupying. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcibly brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose land we are located. Moad occupies the unceded land of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, and we pay our respects to the Ohlone peoples and their elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. And we encourage everyone to learn more about the native lands they occupy by going to native-land.ca. This evening, we are thrilled to be presenting the discussion, Curating from the Inside, presented in conjunction with our digital exhibition, The Only Door I Can Open, Women Exposing Prison Through Art and Poetry, with our partners, Empowerment Avenue and Flyaway Productions. This is a partnership that began in 2018 and is our second presentation of artwork curated and created from inside prison. This time we worked with people inside Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla to create the digital exhibition that you can find on MOAD's website. A dance performance, If I Give You My Sorrows by Flyaway Productions, which is opening this Friday, October 6th and running through October 15th at Project Arto in San Francisco. And that's accompanied by an in-person exhibition um, of this artwork, as well as tonight's program. And I want to give a big shout out to two people who are not on the panel tonight, but have been instrumental in the creation of um, all that we're doing. And that is Joe Kreider, who's the artistic director of Flyaway Productions, and Christine LaShaw, director of visual arts for liberation at Empowerment Avenue. And I also want to highlight the zine that features many of the um, poet many of the poems that aren't in the exhibition. So this is an expanded um, zine with of poetry from the people in the women's prison, and um, it's for sale. Christine here can help you if you're interested in purchasing one. It's also for sale on the Empowerment Avenue website, as is all of the art um, in the exhibition. So. Um, for those of you who are familiar, you know that communication between inside and outside of prisons can be challenging. We are excited that our co-curators, Tamikia Johnson and Chantelle Jeanette Black, will be calling in from um, CCWF in Chachilla um, tonight to join the conversation. Um, we've tried to create a seamless schedule that will incorporate their calls at exactly the right time, but bear with us if it doesn't exactly work, of course, calling from prison um, to the outside is always a challenge. So we might just stop what we're doing when the phone rings and, and start talking to uh, Tamikia and then Chantel. Um, I also want to tell you all about the many things that you have on your chairs. Um, you have information about the digital exhibition. You have a postcard about the dance performances. Um, you also have a postcard, a blank postcard and pencil those are for if you have questions for um, our co-curators, Tamikia or Chantal, um, you can write them on the card and uh, Robin will be happy to read them um, while we have them on the phone. Um, and then you also have a purple piece of paper with a QR code, which is a program survey. We'd love to get your feedback um, about our programs and it helps for writing grants and um, knowing what our audience, who our audience is and what they're interested in. So if you can fill out that online program survey. We would love that. Um, so now, oh, and I just also want to mention we will do live Q&A with the folks on stage. So you don't need to write the questions on the card for them. That's just for um, Tamiki and Chantel when they call in. Now I will um, introduce our moderator for the program. Robin S. Levy is a women's human rights consultant who writes and speaks on women's human rights in the United States. In addition, Robin is currently an independent college counselor. From 2012 to 2019, she was college outreach manager at Student Ri Students Rising Above, which supports low-income first-generation students in applying to and then successfully graduating from college. Until April 2012, Robin was the founding human rights director at Justice Now, which partners with people inside women's prisons to build a safe, compassionate world without prisons. Um, Robin is also the co-editor of Inside This Place, Not Of It, Narratives from Women's Prisons. 
She's a 1993 graduate of Stanford Law School and has written and spoken extensively on women's human rights here and abroad, including the Women's Institute for Leadership for Human Rights, the Drug Policy Alliance, and the Women's Rights Division of Human Rights Watch. Now I will turn it over to Robin. Thank you, and um, I'm not great with microphones, but I know that we're having this recorded for the future, so I'm gonna do the best that I can. Um, I'm gonna start by reading a poem by one of our co-curators, Tamikia Johnson, just to make sure that we are affirmatively bringing the voices of the artists into the space before we start talking. And this poem was based upon the prompt, how is your bed, um, how is your bed an antidote? And, and Tamikia created this poem, which then really a lot of the work of the exhibit that we're gonna be talking about, that you're gonna be seeing artwork of, oh, my pen just dropped, sorry about that, and, um, and that, that it's in the digital online version, that that, art, that work kind of came from this, sort of as this genesis, this prompt, and this poem. Okay. I've been giving it some thought about how the only door I can open in prison is an invisible one, leading to my bunk bed. It calls me when it wants and needs me. Sometimes it betrays my insomnia, giving me a few drips of sleep, even driving me crazy in my nightmares. Still can't get enough of it, like a toxic relationship providing for a tough ride, where I confide my deepest secrets. The view of lazy, muddled clouds barely making sense, hovering over barren land and indentured people. It's hard to block calls from the population, no matter how high the perch of my bunk bed, of my, of my top bunk. People forget my weaknesses, get ironed out up here, where I work out my salvation. It's my safe haven, a place I avoid danger and don't have to speak. I can daydream, meditate, and have visions. I look over and I'm happy at my reflection in the mirror. Sometimes I don't want to come down. A new meaning of cold feet. Did I mention my blankets draw up? Obscure, balanced by a frame that keeps me stabilized. A mattress that aggravates my sciatic nerve and a pillow that makes it hard to hide my neck pain. No matter the mistakes I made, my, no matter the mistakes I make, my bed accepts me for who I am, depreciates all I do. I can cry, moan, sulk, or engage in inside sports like pity party when my heart's torn to pieces. I can take off my clothes, drama, armor, problems, and drop my responsibilities to focus. Unlocking my day, examining my circle, reflecting on my overtime work being all I can be. You can find me releasing regrets while maintaining good body language. God and I have late night conversations, intimate, but I can never get naked, so sleepy, can't sleep, angst and hypervigilant. My bed makes time for it all. Chastity, no one has been here before. Saving it for the man of God's choosing. I count my blessings, pray, pray for provision, keep sense of things, listen to God's voice, hold myself in the rain, create and express myself to all and everything that loves me. Very beautiful and powerful. And now I'm going to read the introduction, introduce our panelists in the order that they are sitting and the order in which they will be speaking. All right, Rasan Thomas is a writer, director, podcaster, producer, consultant, social justice advocate, and the executive director of Empowerment Avenue. Whew, I'm tired. Empowerment Avenue is a program he created while incarcerated to meet the pre-entry needs of incarcerated writers and artists, helping them get their voices in mainstream spaces for prevailing wages. As a freelance writer, he has bylines in Business Insider, The Appeal, Boston Globe, and The Marshall Project. He is most known for co-hosting and co-producing the podcast Ear Hustle, which is available on Spotify, Apple, and wherever you get your podcasts and um, as well as appearances in the United States of America and the documentary, What These Walls Won't Hold. Initiate Justice credits Rasan with sparking the campaign that led to the successful restoration of voting rights for people on parole in California. Friendly Signs, a short documentary he directed and produced while in prison, premiered at the San Francisco Doc Fest. All right, and now I'm gonna read the, the biographies, the um, bios for our two 
curators. Chantelle Jeanette Black, actually I'm gonna to go to Tamikia first because hopefully she will be calling in first. Tamikia Johnson is a black woman born in Torrance and raised in Compton, Cal wait, is Tamikia calling in first or no? Okay, good. Sorry about that. Tamika earned a, um, Tamika Johnson is a black woman born in Torrance and raised in Compton, California. Tamika is earned, earned a bachelor's degree in public administration focusing on criminal justice while on a basketball scholarship from Cal State Dominguez Hills. She is a certified minister of the gospel, a distinction obtained while incarcerated in the Central California Women's Facility where she is currently housed. Tamikia has published as a prison journalist in publications like Prison Journalism Project and the Spotlong Review. Her poem, Queen Restored, sold at auction, and she wildly impressed judges, staff, and peers with an art exhibit she curated for Black History Month 2022. This project is her second time curating an art, exhibit, uh, art exhibition. Chantelle Jeanette Black was born and raised in California and started drawing from a young age. She is self-taught in painting, beading, jewelry making, scrapbooking, dance, and a plethora of other arts and crafts. She graduated cum laude from California State University, Sacramento in 2013, and was teaching an art class in the Central California Women's Facilities Art Therapy Program before it shut down in 2023. She also volunteers to create holiday decorations for her housing unit and makes painted decorative pillows and blankets for other incarcerated people to purchase with canteen food. The only door I can open. Women expo oh, this is her first curatorial project. Okay. And now we're gonna go down the line to Laura. So Laura Lane Ellis maintains a nonstop career of performing, choreographing, and producing in the Bay Area. She currently performs and tours with two award-winning companies, Dimensions Dance Theater and Flyaway Productions. Her first project with Joe Kreider's Flyaway Productions was in 2014. Ellis has been awarded an Is Isadora Duncan Dance Award for Outstanding Individual Performance and numerous funding awards for her own choreographic and producing projects. She is a co-founder and executive director of the African and African American Performing Arts Coalition, co-presenters of the Black Choreographers Festival here and now. Ellis is a dance educator serving on the faculty for the theater and dance departments at the Athenian School and CSU East Bay. She also serves as a board member for Robert Moses Kin and Oaktown Jazz Workshops. And finally, at the end, we have Dr. Rachel Nelson. She is a director and chief curator of the Institute of the Arts and Sciences at UC Santa Cruz and co-director of Visualizing Abolition, an art-based art public scholarship initiative on prisons, art, and the movement for abolition. She has curated and organized ex exhibitions with artists including Carlos Mato, Mato, Forensic Architecture, Sadie Barnett, Jackie Sumel, Maria Gaspar, Carolina Casero, and David De Rosa, among others. Nelson also writes and publishes extensively on contemporary art and geopolitics, including exhibition catalog essays, journal articles, and reviews in the Journal of Curatorial Studies, Public History Weekly, Brooklyn Rail, NKA, Third Tusk, Savvy, and African Arts. She teaches in the History of Art and Visual Cultural Department at UC Santa Cruz. So as you can see, we have a really powerful and diverse panel that is going to it's bringing about and working in the intersection of art and incarceration in a variety of ways, and I think we'll be able to explore that. Um, one thing I want to say before I start is, as you heard, um, uh, when I, I worked at Justice Now, which is a organization that worked to um, end imprisonment, and one of the things I always remember was our office was filled with the art of from people inside women's prisons. And so when I heard this, I was like, this is just amazing because that gave us energy to keep doing our work. And one of the gifts from my um, eldest daughter in our baby shower was a beautiful crocheted blanket made by um, a woman inside, um, specifically for Hannah. And that is something that I treasure and is in our keep closet and is just gonna leave when Hannah leaves the house. Um, so I'm excited to do this. So we're gonna start with Rasan, who's gonna talk a little bit about his own art and his own journey, and of course, Empowerment Avenue and this exciting exhibit that we have. I remember um, growing up in Brownsville, Brooklyn, New York, which is a neighborhood with like 21 housing projects. And I remember doodling, like drawing, making little drawings on my homework and little drawings here and there. But at some point, safety became more important in school, and art got lost. 
And when people ask me, what did I need as a young man so to not to go on a path that ended up in the penitentiary? Um, maybe emotional intelligence, maybe safety. But the biggest thing I needed wasn't even about what I needed. It's what my mother needed. She needed equality. She was a 19-year-old woman that had me. Got my brother a few years later. Somehow, somewhere in there, she got a bachelor's degree. Super educated, super smart. But yet, her salary from the jobs that she got as a black woman back then kept us in Brownsville. She had a college education and kept us in Brownsville because it wasn't equal. She wasn't paid fairly. And so I'm a huge advocate for women growing up, being raised by a single strong black mother as myself. Later on, I found my art in prison. I had 55 to life sentence. It felt pretty hopeless, like I was never coming home. So I felt like my voice is still free, so I'm gonna write. I'm gonna do something with my voice to make a difference and not die a loser and to make my mom proud. So I started writing, and for years I wrote with no support, with no training, with no mentor, until finally I got to San Quentin. And in San Quentin, they have all kinds of writing programs. They have all kinds of art programs, and I took advantage of them all. I took advantage of the writing program, the creative writing program, the, the media center, journalism, ended up being with the podcast. I took advantage of the college program, and I blossomed. I blossom, especially after meeting Emily Nanko and creating Empowerment Avenue, which connects incarcerated people to resources to develop their artistic careers and their writing careers, their journalism careers. I went from publishing eight stories in seven years and making $400 to publishing 42 stories in 31 months and paroling with nearly $30,000. I also noticed that there are amazing artists when I was in San Quentin, amazing artists, and a perfect storm happened. I became a curator, and that led to this event today. The first part of the storm was Brian Stevenson came into our prison and he spoke about if you want to do something about the criminal justice system, you need to be proximate to it. That's so when I thought about that, like, wow, how do we get people to come near us? Right? And I thought about art, because the thing about art, the magic about art, is that even when you're painting about your pain, it's beautiful. And I saw some amazing artists in the William James Art and Correction Program that I felt like just giving their art away. And I'm like, how can you just give your art away? Like, Slavery is supposed to be over, and I don't care if we're in prison, forget that 13th Amendment. Like, we got to figure this out. I actually bought two paintings from some guys, and I'm like, yo, when y'all blow up, I'm going to be rich. This is my retirement plan right here. <laughs> I still have them paintings, too. I'm waiting. <laughs> and so um, we started thinking about, like, how can we reach the outside world, bring people in? And we started thinking about it couldn't be a prison program because they wouldn't let us make money. They gave us all these opportunities to learn and grow, and then we couldn't do nothing with these skills but, but paint for ourselves or paint for a world that didn't value our art. And so we created a mechan mechanisms to get art out. And in, in doing this, we were seen by Joe Crowder of Flyway Productions. She actually reached out. She was looking for a black incarcerated organizer to do an event. I'm like, what? That's me. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> so we ended up doing this amazing event. It was crazy. Um, I got the curate. I didn't even know what curator was. They started asking me, like, what's your theme? What do you mean, theme? <laughs> <laughs> write this essay. I got to write an essay? Is that one of my job, too? <laughs> I mailed you the paintings. What more you want from me, people? But I did it, and it was great. 26 different articles covered it. Um, it was amazing. Uh, one of those guys ended up to be a writer return. Gary Harrell ended up going on to be a writer return fellow when he got out of prison. These artists are blowing up. They're doing their damn thing. And now here I am back again, this time with two women curating from Chowchilla. And how that came about is Moet wanted to do it again. You do something great, you do it again, you repeat it, right? And look, and look to build on that. But let's take it to another level. Let's do something that worked, but do something new with it. And so we thought women. And uh, coincidentally, um, Chantel had started writing me, just wanted to be a pen pal at the Cleveland Sky. She heard about my work with Initiate Justice. She's with Initiate Justice too. She wanted some mentorship, whatever. She just reached out. And the timing turned out to be perfect. I had recruited Christine LaShore around in to bring her experience from the Oakland Museum to help us develop the art side. Because as a curate, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was making it up as I went along. Um, but I know art is beautiful. I know people inside are beautiful. And I knew that I can pick beautiful things and make something happen. And so um, now here we are today with these two women curators. I was corresponding with, telling them about the, uh, what we're trying to do and trying to give them you know, some tips that I learned from my one time curating. Uh, but it's crazy. Um, the difference in that exhibit and this exhibit 
you can see it. Like you can see the talent of the women, but the men, they have the William James Art and Corrections Program. They have canvases and instructors coming in to teach them how to paint and take the, they have the books to read about Picasso and abstract and pointillism and they're learning all this stuff and it shows up. These guys are amazing and the women are just amazing, but they're not supported. They're not supported at all. And I look around the room and I see they're not supported. And so how can we get support for the women? Because they deserve it. My mama deserved it. And um, we always like, we want to save the juveniles. Let's save the kids. Everybody want to invest in the kids. Them kids ain't going to be nothing without their parents. You say the parents, you say the whole family. And it might be cheaper if she got five kids. <laughs> so I'm here today to just really, really advocate, actually plead, man, to just pay attention, more attention to women. In the men's prison, the visiting room is so packed that after about an hour and a half, two hours, you get a tap on your shoulder talking about your visit got to leave to make room for more visitors. But in the women's visiting room in Chowchilla, it is empty. You can stay there all day. And that's not right. Women are the backbone of our society. They hold it down. Somehow y'all work jobs, put food on the table, take care of kids, often without any man's help often without anybody's help. And so women deserve the best. And so somehow we got to figure out how to bring resources to Chowchilla, get more women um, voices out, get more women out of prison. Um, one of the things about Chowchilla too is I believe the biggest prison for women, in the, definitely in California, but probably the world. And how do we get there when we're locking up so many women? And if you take a survey, most women are in there for being trafficked, uh, responding to de domestic violence with fire, um, drug addiction, like, mostly because we failed them. And to make a long story short, we shouldn't be locking up women because we failed them. We should be figuring out how to heal them and how to connect them to resources so they can prosper and make their families whole. At any minute, Tamika's going to call in and tell you for herself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that perspective. We're going to play um, the recordings in just a second of both co-curators. Co um, and there's white cards on your um, seats. And if you would like to write questions for them, please do so, because they're going to call in later. And they're ho hopefully, like, fingers crossed, they're calling in from the um, prison. So we really have to manage the question um, Q&A for our two co-curators. I want to just also just build quickly on what Rosan said, having spent more than a decade working on issues in women's prisons, um, all of that is very true. The, we, we would visit the prison um, two to three times a month, and the visiting, visiting room was almost always empty. And um, when they were going to build a men's prison in the area, uh, or switch one of the women's prisons to be a men's prison, everyone was concerned because now there was going to be issues of, of families visiting because they knew there was never an issue of that with the women's prison. And that was shocking to us because we hadn't realized like how many more visits the men's prisons got that, than, than the women's prisons. And yes, most people inside women's prisons are there for nonviolent offenses. Sometimes, often we call it um, crimes of survival. Is what, is what we're talking about. Um, so I just want to say that quickly, and I'm going to um, let Tamika and Chantel talk for themselves, and they're going to drop a lot of knowledge on you. This call is now being recorded. My name is Tamika Johnson, and my opinion on the only in the official California Women's Facility. I'm a curator of Miss Empowerment Avenue and a project called the Only Day I Can Open. There were several pivotal moments in my young life pointing me into the direction of seriously writing. In high school, I was bumped to the dean's office. He told me that in all his tenure, he had never seen a student earn an A for my English composition teacher. He had to meet me. In college, my English professor was a dark and soft rocking, long hair with a far down middle hippie. He used to sit on his desk cross ankles with sawdust in him. He took interest in me when he saw my potential. He asked if he could tell me. I agreed and I applied all he taught me to my papers 
and I received one of the few A's in his class. I took both students into my sophomore year. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I remember walking into my English class, made some basketball practice. Ice wrapped around my knees, dripping water everywhere. I was surprised the professor was reading my paper aloud as an example of how she wanted all the papers with me. Starting to my feet, swinging down in the door stick, one of my classmates tapped me on the shoulder and told me, she's reading your paper. You have set the standards. It was that moment that I knew that I was a good writer. What this practice has meant to me is a circumspect way of expressing myself, which is not only therapeutic but empowering, as I can advocate causes for myself, for other incarcerated women, and I have a non violent record of self defense for all the challenges I'm faced with in the carceral state dating. Very lack of exit. He once said that intelligence is a weapon of self-defense. I've been working in Cochrane over 12 years, and in that time I met the acquaintance of a vast amount of talented people. I quickly mentally invested the women I knew would be good artists, but also the positive representations on the project. People who are writer free, articulate, and who have witnessed work very hard to deserve the opportunity that Empowerment Avenue is bringing to CCW. To support my artists, I put myself in the position to meet up with them whenever I needed to. I scheduled dates, times, locations. If I saw an artist bragging me, like if I was jogging in the yard, I would stop what I was doing. Go up, ask them if they had any questions, if they needed any help. Sometimes I went to their Hollywood and just stood outside calling out. I would give them different requests. I would simplify instructions or check the status of their pieces. None of them can say that I didn't find ways to get to them. I offered them art supplies. I helped them write their biographies, artist statements, art descriptions, and I broke down the value of their pieces, teaching them how to value them. The artists are like students of homework. They mostly work on their own, in their own things. The only space I really provided was the tabletop of the outside dishes. We sat at the picnic tables and I wrote out exactly what they wanted to say. I navigated the barriers in here the same way I navigate every barrier in CCW. I mostly saw ahead. I can genuinely foresee obstacles. This is still bad. So I account for them. I have plans, backup to the plans, and backup to the backup plans. For example, I was with a black trans man who is a wonderful artist, but I also knew he would be difficult to convince to engage the project. Maybe to work with and to do public relations. Since Moad initially was an African American artist, I went against what I would normally do, which was to pass on him. But to give him a chance, so I had to work from a backwards perspective. Knowing most likely I wouldn't be able to secure him. So I did count him on all accounts. I commit a record I tapped his partner to express him to commit. I gave him several sales messages, going the instances that he didn't finish. There was no loss because I did carry him from the top. I lost my time, I didn't lose an artist. And I thought my plan actually worked. A barrier that didn't set me back. There are a lot of good pieces, but I do remember seeing Sarah my play with our best piece, with the woman, the butterfly, and the Bible scriptures. I was in awe at how she quickly brought together all these art languages. So she created a refreshing spiritual piece. I felt authentic joy looking at her and comparing the woman in the piece to her. Beautiful joy. One of my favorite memories was synergizing with my girl Dare in the final six days, then brainstorming with my co-curator on how to do the thing if I give you my sorrows into our experience. Where we could communicate our needs to the artist to keep everyone on the same page while allowing them the freedom to see themselves. That's how the only door I can open is first. And Christine was all love you. 
And I started seeing it in the literature, and I was shook. Like, they are doing this by words. That was amazing. Cut. This call is now being recorded. Hi, my name is Chantal Jeanette Black. Uh, Godzilla within the institution because of my name change. Um, but I got my self in it last. Um, let me see. I have been doing painting and art well, since my teen years and I'm in my mid-30s now. So for about 15, 20 years I've been painting a lot, doing a lot of drawing. My grandma was an artist and I must have gotten the skills from her. I'm pretty much self-taught. Uh, I never really took any professional art class. Um, I can watch a video of something and learn how to do it, but also like I love going to museums and looking at the paintings there, the professional artists, and trying to figure out their techniques at home, so very self-taught. Um, so when I came to Central California Women's Facility, and Your call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. At first, very limited in art supplies. I got into drawing and drawing comics, um, and just drawing pictures and scenery to kind of keep up my art skills. Uh, for this particular institution, we don't really have, we haven't had an art class. Um, so I worked with the mental health um, therapist and started a art skills class and I did teach an art skills class for people in the mental health program here. Unfortunately that recently shut down, but in the midst of that shutting down they at least started a art group. So now we have a actual like art group within the facility. Um, people, anybody can sign up for it, and which is a really nice introduction into art within our institution. I know that they do painting and drawing and mixed media, which is just fabulous. <coughs> Other than that, people try, within two years you can get what's an incentive program in Handicraft, and then you can order art supplies from certain vendors like Dick Book, and so that's where I got my painting supplies. And luckily, I already had that when I was offered the territorial job with Empowerment Avenue. And that was very fulfilling and very enlightening because at that time, we did not, when we first got started, we didn't have the art class yet, our art group. Um, and so I just kind of had to network within the institution and find people who are interested in doing art and who have the talent or want to expand on their talent get their name out there or tell their story expressively through their art. Um, it was very challenging within this particular institution because I believe we are currently the nations or one of the top largest prisons within the world, at least within the top rankings. And so it's very big for a women's institution specifically, not in comparison to men's. However, we have three separate yards. And within those three separate yards, we can't really intermix, like I'm not allowed on another yard. So I had to find creative ways to work within this system to recruit artists. And um, one of the ways I did that was uh, working with my co-curator, Tamika Johnson, who was housed on the yard. And we um, made a notebook. And within that notebook, it was a comp book, and we like wrote out our plan, um, our prompts, um, questions for bios, and we passed it around to artists that we knew or asked them to network to other artists. And that's how we were able to compile a list of people interested in getting their story out there. And for this particular exhibit with Moed and Empowerment Avenues, our main prompt was how is your bed an antidote to you and if not your bed what is an antidote to you um, for our environment within this institution and a lot of people did believe the bed was their antidote and they would write about what how they felt or what 
what is your replacement if not the bed? Um, it took a lot of effort to coordinate between Tamika and I to get that network, that notebook between the yards. We would meet on main yard at the law library to be able to switch it off there um, and pass it around. And sometimes it was definitely during COVID, so we had to wait a few weeks at times. But in the end, it's like it was very rewarding to be able to get so many women involved and be able to hear their stories and offer them an opportunity to have their stories be heard out there for the viewers to come into this exhibit and see the humanity within the women here and see their motherhood or daughters that are currently in this journey of their life inside of CCWF. Uh, I think it's just a very powerful and very important aspect of our current journey within being incarcerated um, to be able to connect with our community and expand within our society as a whole of like, you know, here we are, please don't forget about it. Um, look at our humanity, look at our remorse and our just feminism and suppression and trials and tribulations and being able to overcome some very difficult challenges in life within the institution and of course the judicial system and everything, society as a whole, um, with women being suppressed and be able to rise up above that and be heard. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the exhibit. And as we mentioned earlier, um, hopefully both co-curators will be calling in. Tamika calling. Oh, Tamika's calling right now, okay. Hello. Hi. Hey, Tamikia. I'm. We just. Uh, Hi. Is that on? Yeah. Okay. We. They actually. Everyone just finished uh, hearing your recording, and I'm going to bring you over to Robin right now, who's going to ask you some questions. Okay. Okay. Hi, Tamikia. How are you? Hi, Tamikia. Okay, how are you? Good. Um, thank you so much for calling in Hi, and for giving. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Tamikia, can you yes. hear me? Oh. What do I need to do? Oh, oh, put the phone closer to the mouth. Yeah, Hi, can you hear me better? Tamikia, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for calling in yes, and giving us such me. a great um, presentation. So um, what I loved is you talked a lot about how you support your artists, but I want to ask you about your art. Um, what has um, exploring your art and your writing in prison, has, what has that brought to you, and what do you hope to, um, to do with it? What do you hope its impact will be? Sorry, that's a hard question. It is what I like hard questions. It's mostly about therapy to me. It made me like probe my feelings and my emotions and, and memory and experiences here in a way that I hadn't before. Because it's, it's asking an interesting question that's like, um, not three way call alerts I usually see, of things I usually see. So it had me big somewhere where um, I hadn't done before mm -hmm. and I waited until I was like in the, this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded I waited until I was emotional when I wrote these I didn't just want to like come off of words and um, I wanted to be more authentic so I waited on purpose until I was like reading something and then I started writing. And what I hope 
it does if it opens people eyes up to like who I am and who I really am inside and how I'm just no different than the next person. I have my own emotional struggles and I hope people can identify with some of the things I said or I hope people can be enlightened seeing something new that they hadn't considered coming from an incarcerated woman before. Well, that's, I have a quick follow-up question. That's, that's amazing. And I don't know if you remember the great Teresa Martinez, um, who, Boo Boo, who was in um, uh, CCWF for many, many, many years. Um, but one thing that, that she had always said is that you have to kind of, you know, if you open yourself and you're in that emotional space, right, then it's really hard to then be out in the prison again, right? So, so how did you do that? How did you write and, and you know, take yourself to that emotional space to do your amazing poetry and then bring yourself again to be able to enter into the yard or what have you? That's something we talk about a lot in groups, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We got a lot of groups here. Yeah. Digging, and we're going to places that we haven't gone before. And we're talking about... So we don't even know how we come out, how I feel, if we're going to cry, you know, if we're going to still cover the truth. Mm -hmm. So, um, at the end of those type of sessions, you have to, like, debrief yourself. You have to, like, come back center. And for me, I just sit for a minute. I just don't do anything. I don't go anywhere. I try not to talk to anybody. I just try to, like, sit with my feelings and wait until it like passes how i'm feeling passes because you're easy in, in that time frame mm -hmm. and i can push my emotions off to the next person unknowingly mm. or unintentionally so i wait i do i let my moments pass and then i go back into the world wow yeah that's that's amazing that's that's really great that's really good sensible um, self-care and, and, and other care. Um, okay, so we have a question from the audience, and that is, what did you learn about yourself through your writing? Is that right? Curating. curating. For your curating, not your writing, your curating, the process of curating, taking you back to the, the broader curation work that you've been doing for this exhibit. I, I learned that God has anything he didn't fathom. I learned that you can have a hidden set of skills and not know that they exist because you're often like working them out in a different capacity. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm an organizer, I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. I like to wear, yeah. I like to write mm -hmm. lyrics to songs. Um, I like to write legal work. And it was like God brought them all together in a way that I would have never thought that they could be brought together. Mm. So I felt like I had some new purpose that I didn't know that I had, that I was oh, waiting for. Wonderful. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that story. All right, I have another, I have another question. Mm -hmm. was, yeah. um, what could you most use okay. to support your art? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, I'm sorry. What could you most use to support your art? People like you guys. Because alone, I'm a small voice. You know, I'm a recluse. Not many people would know I exist. So I really need people like yourself and people that are interested in this work and amplifying this work and assisting people like me to amplify what I'm doing. Like, you guys have to be the one that, like, takes mm -hmm. out the buried treasure and shows it to other people. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. All I can do is just give you what I have. It's just like passing a baton. It's up to other people to, to bring me out. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. that's, um, well, well, we'll keep trying that. How much time do we have? Do you know, Tamikia? This probably 
probably has five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay, do we have any questions from the panel? I want to give the panel the opportunity. Uh, okay. So um, one of our panelists' question is, what is next for you and for art in uh, CCWF? Hmm. Well, because I don't draw, like I'm not a physical artist, visual, um, I have to, this call and or telephone number will be monitored and recorded writing opportunity. So my artwork has to be expressed through words. So CCWF has to put something to get three-way call alert that allows me to pursue that avenue. And I actually just saw something earlier today. They're putting together a journalism group and they're going to have people from, I think, Turkey and first coming into the institution teaching mm -hmm. journalists how to write and how to create stories and come up with ideas and concepts and then potentially get their stories placed in the fan clip news. So I just that today on a bulletin. So I most likely I'm gonna explore that to see what that has to offer, see what that has to bring to my overall experience. That sounds great. That sounds perfect. Right up your alley. I'm gonna. Actually, I'm gonna survive. Uh oh. I got recruited to be one of the volunteers for that program. Oh. Wow. Did you get that? Are you? All right. Abrasan <laughs> is gonna be one of the volunteers for <laughs> that program. Woohoo! Of course he is. <laughs> 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 of course he is. Yeah. Wow! Look at that. Well, that is great. I want to, I think, well, I'm going to close. I'm going to be there. I'm You're going to be there. You're going to be just changing things and writing it up. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're, we're very excited to have that. I'm going to, I'm going to close it up just so we don't get cut off. Unless there's anything you want to share with the audience okay. in general before we go. Anything at all. Thank you. Thank you. Just thank you for spending time out of your life your busy schedules and your own stresses and your own traumas and things that you're working through and coming into our world yeah. where you're really compiling, you know, you're compiling our trauma and our pain and our suffering with yours. So um, that's an extension of a person's self that is hard to ask for. And I just want you to know that I understand that. I see that. I know that. I don't want that to go unnoticed, and I just appreciate that. Thank you. That, that, is, that is so beautiful and lovely. We have one last, last minute question coming in. Yeah, I just want to know, uh, to me, what is your prospect for release? Did you hear that question? What is your prospect for release? <laughs> I know, I know. I have a communication with the governor's office. I've gotten a lot of good feedback over the past Uh oh, I think we might. You know, I'm not, I'm not backslidden. So I feel like everything that I've already put out there to the universe and to the governor's office, I'm just getting better at. You know, I'm just continuing to blossom. So there's really no reason for me to feel like that's not going to manifest itself any day now. Mm -hmm. So I feel like my prospects are good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tanikia. Appreciate it. <laughs> So that was perfect timing and, and amazing. Just um, really good to hear that also she will to continue her art. So we'll take like a deep breath, as Tamikia suggests, um, and we'll transition to talking, have Laura talk and have talk about her, her work with dance and activism. We'll continue to talk about the art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a continuation. 
Um, it's been uh, an incredible learning uh, experience as well as a growth experience working with Flyaway production um, over the last four years now, um, starting with the weight room and building that, um, that piece. Um, every um, artist that performed in that piece, we all had, um, or have, some of us still have, I still have, um, an incarcerated loved one that we support. It made that project um, very personal, um, incredibly authentic. We were not um, putting on characters. We were actually living our own truths through the work as we were telling the stories of um, women who are loving and supporting um, incarcerated family members. Um, so that was the first of a series of projects that Joe um, has been collaborating on um, crafting, because um, it is a craft that is grounded in truth, um, but it is art making and it is um, really profound to be in the center of work that intersects art and social justice because it is our um, goal to dismantle a system that um, has so many issues and, and lacks the humanity that we are hoping the art helps to um, catalyze around connections and bringing to the center the humanity of the citizens that are behind bars and um, helping um, and really um, hoping that the art allows um, spaces and more conversations to happen so that um, communities um, begin to connect and understand the work that's needed to shift the paradigm. Um, so that happened uh, quite powerfully through the weight room when we took the piece to Sing Sing, when we took the piece to um, New Orleans, where there were um, panel discussions, um, community leaders, art leaders that came together and started talking about the needs um, that um, the needs of the people in the community, the people behind bars, what's really needed when people are, um, when our, our fellow citizens come out from behind bars, what is there to support them. These are the really um, important conversations that we were having. Um, with um, Meet Me Swiftly, With Your Mercy, that piece was inspired by my fellow panelist, Rasan, and all of your incredible writing. Um, I had the joy of embodying um, and being inspired by your writing as I stood four stories up on the top of the Counter Pulse um, Theater, um, taking on the energy of community. So that piece was about connecting um, the power of your writing and how it reached outside of the prison walls and began to be um, the center of that piece and to catalyze change. And so um, that was very powerful for me to be in that magenta suit and to um, have the, the chants from inside the prison be the backdrop, the sound that I was um, embodying and performing to. And that was your suggestion, that that be the sound. Um, and that will remain with me, I know, for all of my time. Um, and continues to impact me and um, my work as an artist. So I thank you for that. And currently we're doing, um, uh, If I Give You My Sorrows, which is inspired by If My Bed Is an Antidote um, and the writings of Tamikia, Chantel, and other um, artists that are part of the zine. <laughs> and um, I had the opportunity before I injured my hand, 
to be a part of that project um, performing. And I did get a chance to create quite a bit of the movement that's part of that project. Um, and again, the connections that have been made. Oh, and I have to mention this with the weight room. When we talk about community and connections, I had the opportunity to get to know a few of the advocates from the SC Justice Group. I can't believe I almost forgot that. They really changed my life because they um, really helped me to um, get closer to the incarcerated loved one that I was supporting and to have really significant conversations about the choices my, um, my loved one made and the choices I was making and the shifts that could happen to bring us closer and for me to support that loved one more. And that would not have happened without the connections to Jesse S., um, the SE Justice Group. Um, so when art can intersect to um, catalyze connections and to put humanity center, it's always there, but to really like make us understand that humanity is at the center and that we have to be um, much better at how we support um, our incarcerated citizens, um, it, it makes a difference. Um, so embodying and connecting and art, that um, has been profound and powerful for me. So what I wanted to do this evening is to give us all a chance to know what it's like to make those connections through art. I want to share a, a phrase that um, I created that is in If I Give You My Sorrows. And then I would love for all of us to do that together because I feel like Moving in community um, does shift the paradigm. I believe that as an artist. Even the littlest bit of connecting can, um, can be very powerful and can catalyze change. So I'm going to share the phrase, and then we're going to do it together. What's cool about this phrase is it is seated, so you don't even have to move. The other thing about it is it is gestural. And that is a way we owe it's back the first ways that we move as humans um, in the embryo. And when we first come out, we are gesturing people. So you'll be able to handle this. So let me share it first. Believe me. Does that sound like an educator just then? <laughs> uh -huh. So I'm going to share it first. So you just witness it. Because the other powerful thing about change is witnessing and then taking action. So that's also what we're embodying. We're embodying witnessing and then acting, action as community. So it's a metaphor, but what really is needed to break down systems that are unjust. So just watch and witness first. All you have to do is watch and witness. In this last position, you take anywhere you want. It could be here, like I know you're ready, or it could be here, or it can be here. It can be anything you want that last thing to say. So you get to create your own last idea. So the first thing we're going to do is make sort of like a vessel. And I appreciate your patience as I have the one hand that's really unique. So you make a vessel, and it can be anywhere you want. Then you're going to just clasp the fingers here. Then you look to your left as you change the hand, and then come back, looking from the front. Great. Thumbs open, and you bring your hands to your heart. Press that heart in. Triangle. Trilogy. Break. This is like you're scribing one, two, three times. 
Now it's almost like the figure eight of an infinity is wrapping all around you. One, two, beautiful, three, gorgeous. You can probably recognize this as sort of a feeling of butterfly claps your thumbs and then just let that butterfly fly like it's coming out of a cocoon. Two, and on the third one, release it all like breath into the air and just let the arms float down. And then you take whatever your last statement is, whatever you want that to be. That's it. Thank you. Beautiful. That was amazing. It's, again, I'm a lawyer, so that was like very challenging for me. <laughs> very, very challenging. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on to, I'm just going to call you Dr. Rachel. Dr. Rachel, um, and I'll sort of talk um, coming from this, of the same stuff that we've been exploring, but from more of an academic space, as well as a visual art space. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. This has been incredibly motivating because I think that um, really it reminds me of why I began with my wonderful collaborator, Gina Dent, the Visualizing Abolition Project. And one of the things that I was, we were really thinking about um, was the vast amount of, so, of visual culture that we're surrounded by all the time that normalizes prisons. We know from the, you know, all of the TV shows, the movies, the news articles, everything that we see, the kind of image culture that we live in normalizes a system of punishment. It normalizes a system in which the, um, the huge problems we have as a society, instead of taking responsibility for them, we put people into cages. And really thinking about one of the reasons why this visual culture has been allowed to dominate is because we do not see the work of people who are on the inside. We do not see the things that they are made. As we point out, that in, um, well, the, in the very rare case of San Quentin that actually has an art studio there with the William James Association, most people on the inside don't really even have access to art materials, right? That, um, and I think that, you know, and it's of course not just TV and that kind of media that dictates our visual culture. Our museums, you know, everything that we're surrounded by when we think about the visual world that we see, we're seeing a world that has normalized and naturalized a way of being that I think that all of us in this room know is vastly unnormal, unnatural, and um, should, you know, we have to figure out other ways to be together. So really thinking about the ways in which the abolition movement, the idea that we need to eradicate prisons and utterly change society, means we also need to change the things we see, the way we perceive, the kind of visual world we live in, the materials that we see that have normalized these systems. So we began really to dream and to think about how to do art programming, exhibitions, education that, that allow people to, to think about these things, to begin to see the work that's being produced inside of prisons from people who love people inside of prisons, but also people that don't necessarily have that experience, but also think that this is a problem, right? Because one of the things we also said that there have been amazing exhibitions of art from people who are on the inside, and they are sewn in isolation. You go in and you're like, okay, here's the work of people on the inside. Here are the work of people on the outside. I'm like, how can we begin to blur the lines a little bit between this so that we understand that um, prisons are, are all of our burden. They're all of our burden to solve, not just the folks that are on the inside and those of us who love them. So in this, we started the project in like 2017. It really uh, took root in 2019. And we had our first major exhibition in 2020. And one of the works that we included was actually Prison Renaissance's Metropolis, which is a project that Rassan's in. A lovely project is an audio piece from folks who are on the inside in which they, um, you know, it's many voices talking about the many jobs and the many identities people have inside prisons, right? That prisons, if you put all prisons together, they would be the biggest city in the world. And if you look at the people in them, there's people who do all the jobs in the world within the prison system, right? And one of the things that I found was really inspiring about that work was that if you begin to think about 
um, the city that is, the, the metropolis that is prisons, of course, is also our metropolises, right? They're also our towns, that these aren't separate communities, that we have to figure out how to reimagine the people who are vanished out of our school systems, vanished out of our museums, their visual materials and their bodies as actually being part of the world in which we live in, being part of our towns, being part of our communities. And I thought that that project was really powerful and that it began to help us to see how we are living amongst folks even when we can't see them, right? That they're part of our communities in a really powerful way. So visualizing abolition has continued to grow. We do events, we do exhibitions, we do have artist residents and artist fellows that are inside of prisons, outside of prisons, formerly incarcerated. We're trying to figure out all the different ways that we can support folks, supporting folks who also want to take seriously the movement of abolition as part of their art practices. Of course, we know that if you want to get into most museums, and we will not include this one, but if you want to get into most museums, the kind of art you have to make is not necessarily art that is about changing the world and thinking about things like the movement for abolition. But one of the things that we want to do is to normalize that as a dream, as a wish, as a horizon that we can imagine. Now, within the university context, we also have um, an undergraduate certificate program for kids, for, I'm sorry, they're not kids, for the students at the university who can take classes with us we, um, in visualizing abolition studies, which is a kind of unwieldy name, except for the fact that the course code is vast. So we loved the idea that we could be vast 101, vast, you know, have the course classes. We're working on increasing um, education opportunities um, that blur the lines between the university classrooms and the um, and inside prisons. Uh, looking at how working with people who've accomplished this in other places, particularly graduate education. We just had our first. Um, a uh, graduate student who's currently on the inside finished their qualifying exams. And we are really, really thrilled because what that means and the fact that he took the first, um, uh, first chance to apply for school at UC Santa Cruz, that we were able to get him accepted into a graduate program, that we're figuring out how to, how to support him means that other people can also apply. We're going to take a quick pause here to, because Chantelle, our other curator, is calling in. Kind of amazing. Hi, Chantel. Hi, Christine. So, uh, you are here in front of the panel, and I am going, everyone's heard your um, presentation, and I'm going to pass you over to Robin, who is moderating this conversation, and I'm going to ask you some questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi, Chantel. Thank you so much for calling in for your um, wonderful presentation. Um, I know you talked a little bit about this in the presentation that you, you did for us earlier, but um, can you tell us, what do you hope to come from sharing your art through this exhibit and your curating of this exhibit? Hmm. Honestly, I hope that it reveals the humanity of women incarcerated. I do understand, um, I've only been incarcerated for four years now. Um, five, including county. So when I was out there, I had a very negative impression of people who went to prison um, and felt like, you know, punitive um, punishment was the way to go. And now that I'm in this mess, I see otherwise. And from this side of the fence, it really is very different than the way media portrays um, Proven to be it's orange is in your black is the most inaccurate <laughs> depiction of women prisoners, but right now that's kind of all there is out there. And so I think art is a wonderful way to show the world the humanity of the women inside and in our motherhood, daughterhood, mm -hmm. and our family and like lifestyle. Even though we're in here, we're still family members and not forgotten. 
And, um, and I, I, just to um, piggyback on what you just said there and some of the things you wrote about the great community that you're building um, with inside with using your art, can you maybe share with us one of your favorite stories of supporting your artists and what you've been doing to support your artists um, and, and to put this program together? Okay, well, there was one person in particular um, who needed an extra hand, as in a little extra guidance. Like, they didn't have the confidence within themselves yet. And so when kind of guiding them in this project and, like, you know, let it come from your heart, and they, it was poetry, it was actually um, lovely. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And they were really insecure with their work, but they write very powerful things from their home, like using their hometongue from the heart, from the soul. And they just never thought it was good enough and always wanted to improve and always wanted to edit. Well, what else do I need to change? What else do I need to change? And I guess that it was guiding them into recognizing that your work is amazing work. Your, your words are powerful. You're sending messages that are going to drive home to some people out there. And that was very, I guess, uplifting and enlightening for them to have that extra or external um, confirmation that what they are doing is just right. And they just needed some extra, a little extra fortune, a little extra validation. But watching somebody grow like that is um, it's very fulfilling and heartwarming. Yeah, it, it sounds amazing, and, and talking about the important work that you're doing. How have you seen, just to turn it back to you, how have you seen yourself grow through this curating process? Ooh, um, I, the number one thing that comes to mind is networking and navigating. So I guess it's two things, sorry. <laughs> but um, networking with the inside person is very important. And um, as I mentioned, I haven't been down very long. I've only been in this prison for four years. So I haven't gotten a chance, especially with three of those years being like our COVID lockdown. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to explore much of the people outside of my yard. So we're separated with three yards. It's, um, a yard is in Cape, in Bravo, Charlie, and Delta Yard. And we can't really communicate. So that's where the networking and the navigating come in is I had to figure out ways to connect with people in other yards, figure out who they are, what they're about, a little character, um, not trusting all rumors, just trying to get to know the individual, but that's the kind of distance. So the navigating of like, well, how can I learn about this person? How can I figure out who's who? And then how can I get information from them directly, which is where that notebook came in. And I um, put together a comic book and passed it um, to the co-creator, Tamika Johnson, um, who works at the gym with the coach and I was always in the law library. So they're right next door to each other and we were able to meet up in a what's called main yard, which is separate from all of our yards. And then I could pass her the notebook and she could take it to her yard to pass the people, they write in it and it gets back to me. And so that way everyone was able to put in what they have to say about themselves or what they went to do with their art or what they said or what an antidote was to them in this place. It's a big learning experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your your logistical skills are now off the charts. Um, do we have um, some I want I want to I, I want to get a question here from the audience, which is, um, what could you most use to support your art? Oh, um. I would say art supplies in here, in this particular institution, are limited. Um, we finally do have an art program now, which we have set up a call for action for people to please donate art supplies um, directly mm -hmm. to our CRM for that art program. Um, and then for individual artists like myself or other people who, um, all the artists within this particular exhibit, 
most of us are on what's called the handicraft program, which every prison has the handicraft program, but this particular prison utilizes it as an incentive. So you have to be two years disciplinary free in order to apply for a handicraft card, and then you can buy supplies from an outside vendor like Thick Lick. Um, so there's that whole navigating, um, you know, either you get into the art program here, which has limited slots and a rotation, or you stay disciplinary free and you get to order a box if you have help from someone on the outside, because um, you certainly don't make enough money at eight cents an hour to purchase supplies from Big Lake. And people on the outside can um, donate art supplies. I just want to make sure I got that right. Yes, absolutely. Um, I gave an address to Christine to um, post for our call for action um, mm -hmm. to donate directly to our CRM, the Community Resource Manager. Her name is Mrs. Waybright. And if they donate... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Just mailing it to her, FedEx, directly from Amazon, or even if you had um, unused art supplies at home that are unopened. Um, they would be able to send them in. And then of course, there's a process once it gets here, like ISU have to investigate it and make sure there's nothing right. in there that's not supposed to be in there. And then um, they'll make sure it gets to the art program to be utilized appropriately. I have to say, I can tell you spend a lot of time in the law library. You have your organizational <laughs> skills are amazing. Um, you got to be, I, I'm sure you're going to have a line at, they're not going to let you do your art. They're going to keep wanting to have you help with their like um, complaints and whatnot. You're going to be writing dockets the whole time. Um, okay, do we have a, another question? Or um, from, actually, oh yeah. So I want to ask, um, the, I'm going to see if the panel has any questions that they want to um, toss out to you. Okay. I can keep talking to you forever because I'm a lawyer, so I love organization. And, you know, I read your, your bio, and actually, I would like to communicate with you on the side. <laughs> right up my alley. Absolutely. I'm going to rebuild my human rights documenters right here, right now. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So what is next for you? Where are you taking your, your art um, next? And, um, and then if you can handle this, too, what is your favorite piece? So, so this is a question from Laura, since now that I know you have all our bios, I'm going to identify. So from Laura, it's like, what is next for you in your art, and what is your favorite piece of art, and why? It's a two-part. Oh, my favorite piece of art. Oh, so I, I'm torn. I have a, can I give two favorites? Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so um, when I was in the free world painting, I did this amazing oil mixed media piece. And um, I had a friend who was in a band, and I painted an image of their guitar with a uh, thick black background, and I did streaks of a really dark purple, so it would only kind of reflect in the light in certain lighting that you would see the purple pop. The guitar itself was a brownish, copper gold mix of colors and then i use um wooden pegs to glue onto the board and copper wiring as the strings that went up so it really made it three-dimensional mm -hmm. being mixed media mm -hmm. and it just looks so it, it, my favorite um but then i also have an at home to the heart favorite and it would be the unknowingly last day that i spent with my daughter um, before my incarceration was September 23rd of 2017, and I took her to a painting class, um, like, you know, the wine and painting, but it was one made for children, mm -hmm. so there was no wine. Um, and we painted the scene up of the house flying up in the clouds with balloons. And at the end of the um, exhibit, we treated painting. She got mine and I got hers. So mm -hmm. that will... That's super special. And she was seven when we did that. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that story with us. My, um, the, the first part of the question from Laura is, what is next for you in your art and in your life? 
and my life will turn. Okay, I'm going to start. do the life. art first. You're avoiding telling <laughs> us about the art. Tell us about the <laughs> art. <laughs> I caught you. I caught you. I caught you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the, the reason for that is the complication of this institution. Mm. I have been on the hobby craft program for two years because um, I made it the first two years disciplinary free and I got on hobby craft right away. Like that was my motivation to stay right at free. It mm-hmm. worked really well. <laughs> um, and one of my bosses came here in February that I am perfectly entitled to, but because the powers that be of the system have some flaws, I'm going to put very nicely. <laughs> Um, my boss is being denied to me since February, and I'm six months doing it, which is filing a grievance, like an appeal, mm-hmm. you know, so it can go above certain people's heads, and it's all due process rights. Um, and I am every right to, every entitlement right to have this box, and they are just denying me every step of the way, and I'm getting very frustrated. Um, so, we're going on seven months here, I still don't have my box, which means I'm totally out of paint. And I am on pause in my art. So mm. instead, I have been elaborating on the writing skill. Okay. Um, and I really want to write things to get other messages, actually, honestly, in, like, human rights, women's liberation, um, free us from the oppression that we are under from society and further oppressed within this institution. Um, that is my passion right now. I am in college here. Mm -hmm. The Fresno State University bachelor's program to get my second bachelor's Mm -hmm. is going to be in social sciences. Mm -hmm. And then they have a, um, I forget what it's called, but um, I can apply to the master's program in humanities and kind of have like that foot in the door. You have 60 seconds remaining. Oh, okay, so we have 60 so, seconds. Um, so tell us quickly, what do you want, just one last thought, what do you want this audience to know and understand? We are, the women inside this prison are just people, mothers, daughters. Some people make mistakes, some people end up here um, out, not by their own mistakes, by others' mistakes, for all sorts of reasons. Just keep that in mind. If we spread the word to vote, carefully for us to help us bridge the gap between us and the community and share our art to share our story. Because we each have our own story to share. Thank you so much. And we will be in touch. Take care. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I mean, she, she mentioned the media and the humanity. Yeah. Yeah, and then and, and in the end talked about, yeah. don't forget, yeah. like, and, and come out and support us. So she actually touched yeah. upon and all and of the, even, like, the themes. The degree, and just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, you know, and I, I mean, I'm always amazed, and I've done a lot of events where we've included people who are on the inside through the phone. And one of the things is you get the glimpse of how the systems really work. And the moment she starts talking about her inability, how she has not gotten this box, right? And you can see that um, whether or not there's some guy sitting there like rubbing his hands in glee, we don't, we can put that aside, right? But the whole system works to keep the walls as thick and as unporous as possible, right? To keep people from having a chance to express themselves, from, for, to being seen, all the different ways. I was thinking, I always count how many times they break through and say the message is being recorded. Anytime we're doing a live event with somebody, they, it breaks through more often. I'm just gonna tell you, I mean, I'm not just suspicious. I also just know, you know, you can just tell on the kind of rhythm of it. And you know, it's like the, the they're fighting so hard to keep this from happening that we have to fight extra hard to insist that we get to see, right? And yep. thank you all for all your work, and thank you, Rasan, for really spearheading this, right? And I think for paying attention to the fact that truly, as we've said over and over and over again, that women in the inside are the most invisible. And we also know the fastest rate, growing rates of incarceration are black women. OK, 
Okay. I'm going to start off with a question for each of the panelists and then open it up to the, um, to the general audience. And this is going to be, I don't know, it might be a little bit controversial question, so I'm going to give you a tough one, Rasan. We've heard, you've spoken a lot, you spoke about how until you came to San Quentin, you hadn't had an opportunity really to explore your art. We heard um, Chantel talk about the lack of art supplies and, um, and also her box being taken away from her indefinitely. Um, at the same time, we've also been talking about abolition and about how we, you know, uh, our lack of support for there being a prison system. Would you, do you support having a, having building up art programs in prisons, other men's prisons in San Quentin, the women's prisons, or do you see that as enforcing the prison system? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's a complicated question, so you're gonna get a complicated answer. We need healing centers. We don't need prisons, we need healing centers. But I'd rather invest in root causes than and, and stopping root causes of crime instead of spending billions on healing centers. And so my shortcut would be to repurpose prison into healing centers. And so, you know, they say any reform that leads to abolition is a good reform. And if you give people opportunity to, to, to remake themselves from drug dealers or drug users into artists, if you give them a way to get the public to care and, and connect with them, if you give them a way to make an income, um, you, you break the cycles of poverty, you break the isolation, you break all these root causes of crime, and you get a citizen that, that's ready to re be returned. Because as bad as I want to shut prisons down tomorrow, if we don't do the things that we need to do to heal people, to connect them to careers, to educate them, it would be a crime spree if we shut the prisons down tomorrow. And so we have to work on getting them shut down next week. We can do this really fast, get the art programs in, <laughs> and get the people out. <laughs> Thank you. It is. Um, it's like do it all, but um, and that's kind of part of the problem. I think with abolition is we're like it is complicated, and people don't like complication. They want simple. Toss them in jail um, is a simple answer. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Laura, and you kind of alluded to it a little bit, and then gave us a little bit of a feeling. But how do you feel that dancing can articulate and get us to understand incarceration in a way that maybe is different from visual art and writing? The physicality of it, um, I think embodiment is very powerful because it's visceral and it has an emotional center that can happen in writing, it certainly does and can happen in visual art, but you're actually seeing other human beings um, expressing a particular story. Um, there's something about too around movement that um, someone that's witnessing that movement can begin to um, layer their own story and their own experiences within what it is they're witnessing. And sometimes um, when you're seeing a visual art, um, if it's abstract, maybe that can happen, but movement tends to be abstract, even if it's telling um, a story that has a literal and, um, and um, realistic root we take those ideas and make it into an abstract form that anyone can lay their own narrative, their own truth within it. And I think that is really the power of it. And we can take something like Rassan's writing or a visual representation of um, an art piece and begin to, again, embody and shift the, the way that story is being told, right? So there is visual manifestation in the embodiment. And then with Joe Kreider's work, and I have to at this moment give a shout out to Joe Kreider, who doesn't do any of this work without deep research, without cultivating actual relationships with the other artists that she's collaborating with. Um, it also brings a lot of truth and honesty to the work because I think it doesn't really um, impact if it doesn't have authenticity and truth at its center. Um, but there's also text and very um, sophisticated, complex sound scores that go along with the art that she does. So I'm gonna talk about Jill's work right now for a moment specifically. Um, because what I'm talking about doesn't happen in all 
forms of dance, right? But with Joe Kreider's work in Flyaway specifically, we are taking something that seems very impossible, like aerial work, because I'm doing dances 80 feet up in the air, 70 feet up in the air, four stories, two stories. My um, dance peers are flying and doing things that seem to be defying gravity. So just the act of what we do is a metaphor for what can seem impossible and really complex and challenging and hard is possible. So when Ransan says something about like, let's just do this thing in a week, what we do in defying gravity seems impossible to the people witnessing it, but it's all possible. You need to find all of the ingredients that make that thing possible. Do the research. Find the collaborators that can do the rigging and can do all of the internal mechanical functioning. And then keep the artist always right at the core of it because we are the innovators and we are the, the big thinkers. And we can find the way to navigate the things that politics and red tape say can't be done. We have the solutions for those things. So continue to keep us as the organizers, as the brain trust, to find the answers to the complicated things. That's actually what I think dance art does. That's beautiful. So I'm gonna um, go, to, go to Dr. Rachel. Um, I, just, I just like saying it. I don't know why. I'm a weirdo. I'm a total weirdo. And, um, and I think kind of in some way combine actually both these pieces and um, because, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's clear abolition is a passion of mine. And, and I had started doing that work in 1997 just to age myself right here, right now. And, um, and one of the frustrations was we weren't seeing much progress. And then hearing you talk about a visualizing abolition, abolition study certificate and, and these undergrads and working on it and really you know, taking it international and doing these connections, what have you seen in terms of the movement there and what, what change have you seen? I mean, it's truly amazing. I mean, nobody would have thought <laughs> that we could. Um, and actually, you know, we had this moment where we were like, oh, crap, we named our program Visualizing Abolition. We're never going to get back inside. You know, we were like, we didn't expect to just keep going. And um, weirdly, that hasn't been the case. I don't know why. But this, the moment of, you know, 2020 was the biggest outpouring of people into the streets in history and the, the normalization of the, how fast people were able to say the word abolition. There has been decades and decades of work to get to us to this point. So, you know, I mean, as you said, aging you, no, it just shows, you know, you were adding into a movement, this movement that's just grown and grown and grown and grown. And when our students come in, they think they know what abolition is. And I have to stop them because, of course, they don't. But I'm like, holy crap, my students think they know what it is, you know? And again, they can see it as a horizon. And we know that 10 years ago that most people could not see that as a horizon, that they thought that that was impossible. And the fact that we can sit here now and we talk about um, non-reformist reforms, right? Mm -hmm. And I would say that I want to also say that for at, you know, within the abolition movement, we don't leave anybody behind. And so, of course, the importance of having art, of having education, right? We're not propping up the prison system. We're tearing it down from within. And without leaving any, ab abandoning anyone within it would be the goal, right? I mean, it's a, it's a thin line, but you know, that's the hope. But yeah, I mean, I think that watching it and being very systematic, because as you know, we all know, the abolition movement has been so systematic about language. They roll out terms, right? Abolition, one, prison industrial complex, right? They, you know, this is like tons and tons and tons of um, people that are coming together, let me just say women of color primarily, right? Doing the work to bring us to whole different lexicons that then we can um, build on. And I mean, it's such a freaking thrill to see this work come to the place where it just comes off of people's tongues, where people are even dreaming this. And I would just say thank you to everyone that's come before, everyone that will come after, 
I mean, thank goodness prisons are going to be gone next week, and we will work on that and work on that. And, uh, you know, because we're, we're changing every minute. We're changing the society that makes that possible, right? Yeah. Can I just add to some laws that would um, turn the prison systems around real quick? Uh, one is ACA 8. Uh, I lost track of where it is. I got to do some research myself. But there's a movement to try to end the 13th Amendment slavery clause in the California Constitution and a nationwide movement to end it, period. And if that happened, that means nobody can work, work a job every day or eight days or, or five days a week for 30 years and come on with nothing. It means you would have to either pay me to work a real wage or I don't have to work for you. Right? It would change the prison system dramatically because they can't afford to keep that prison going on prison labor, paying normal wages. That means they have to be really choosy about who really needs to be there, who really needs healing, and who, who's just warehoused. Right? And so that's a major law. Also, they're trying to get voting rights back um, for people in car in, in, who are incarcerated. And what that would do is make people feel like they're included in society. And not only that, many people have been in prison for decades under laws they never had no say-so in. Before they were, ever got the right to vote, they were in prison. Mm -hmm. And so here they are being taxed with our representation, which we I thought was a no-no, so we threw tea in the water for, right? right? So let's, get, let's throw some more tea in the water. So these are a couple of things that are in the air. And of course, in Palmer Avenue, we already know, like we're gonna um, end slavery regardless. We're gonna work from outside the system to make it better. Yeah. That's what we do, that's what's done. And um, just to, before I go into the, um, uh, putting audi audience questions just to build on what Rasan said about the voting rights thing. So first of all, so Chantel said vote, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of people you can vote on. When you think about when they do the census, they count incarcerated people within those counties. So their 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 representatives and their um, the number of votes that they get is based upon these folks who are living there who have no vote. So just keep that in mind. Um, there also is that the QR code on the on the um, thingy thing, <laughs> the chair, um, can connect you with a, a um, to-do list of a lot of opportunities to sort of to weigh in on some of these laws, to send art supplies to the prisons, um, and a wide variety of other stuff. I'm going to stop talking and see if the audience has any questions that they would want for this amazing panel. I don't think I need a microphone. You need it for the recording. Oh, I'm so used to talking in galleries. I just want to thank you all so much. I'm Kijo Lee. I'm the chief curator here at MOAD. And so what I want to know from you is what could MOAD be doing that we're not? <laughs> yeah. I got to turn it on? Oh, they, tried to, they tried to silence me, son. They tried to silence me. <laughs> I think MOAD is doing a lot. But I will say, and I talked to you about this before, both of these amazing exhibits have been online. We want to get on your walls. Yeah. Let's get on your walls, man. Let's do something different. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm trying to figure out how to do this, but maybe you can help me figure it out. I think there's some really, really, really super amazing artists. I'm telling you, I bought two paintings. I need to blow this boy up so I can get my retirement money out of it. <laughs> um, but my idea is kind of like a Kendrick Lamar thing. Like, what if somebody who is just as dope as Kendrick Lamar open for him that you never heard of? And when people come to see Kendrick Lamar, they see um, Pee Wee Herman. I don't know. Whoever this other guy is. <laughs> I don't know. Whoever this other guy is. Billy Joe, whoever. Scram Jones, Boogie. <laughs> Lonnie Morris, all right? They see Lonnie Morris, all right? And so I, was, I wonder if you have some amazing artists, like maybe Joe Sam or whoever, who's just a really amazing artist that we can find somebody with a similar style. And if you like this guy, like kind of like an Amazon thing. If you like Sun, you'll like Sun, right? And we compare these two people together to really bring attention to how awesome these guys. I mean, they're amazing. They should be getting 30000 a painting. They should be doing amazing things instead of like what they're doing now. And so how, so how can we elevate people um, and take them to the next level? Those are two. I got more, but I think I'm going to let the panel speak on it as well. But those are two major things. If you do those, I'd be very happy with you. <laughs> I'm going to just say, too, that um, is it on? Did it stop working? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things I'm like, 
Ruth Wilson Gilmore always says, change everything, right? I came in this lucky way in that when um, I became director of UC Santa Cruz Institute of the Arts and Sciences in 2019, 2020, right when the pandemic came. And then um, we, didn't even we didn't have a professional gallery space. So I built a program with these ideas at the, at the center of it, you know, which means that like when we hire, you know, how we hire people, you know, the amount of students we recruit from um, the formerly incarcerated student population at the school, like all these different parts that are able to do it. But I do think, and the fact that it was a blank slate made it a lot easier. And the fact that I didn't have a board that was going, you know, don't, yeah, what are you doing? Don't, you can't change anything because we love it. But I think that there's those like incremental, and part of it is giving people jobs. You know, the formerly incarcerated folks have such a hard time coming out, you know, and the, having a place where they know they can actually get jobs in the culture industry, it's like a huge. You, you're about to get an invite to the San Quentin Art Expo, January 26th. That's exactly about that. Bringing in people from the outside who are in the art industry, the film industry, the music industry, all these industry, corporate America, mm -hmm. and figure out how can we uh, connect people on, on parole, once they parole, once they return to society, to jobs that doesn't necessarily mean they blow up as this gallery artist mm -hmm. or this rap star or this major filmmaker, right? How can they just make a decent living um, in doing what they love in another capacity? Designing creative future. Designing creative. Designing creative. Designing the interns creative. designing creative futures. Oh, okay. So um, there's an organization called Designing Creative Futures, mm -hmm. and what it does, it, it takes formerly incarcerated people, and it pays them to intern for our organizations. And so they are paying, you, and they pay you as well. They give you a thousand dollars per intern that you take on, and so that way you're motivated to take on somebody and let them learn the craft, let them learn what they can about the art industry from behind the scenes. It makes me think of we're trying to build pathways for undergraduate students into things like art handling and registration, super lucrative careers in the arts that no one knows about. So there are opportunities to think about because people don't know that conservators get the closest to the artworks. They don't know that art handlers are touching, handling, and it is a highly skilled position um, and highly sought after. And so there are also other pre-existing uh, organizations, partnerships, HBCUs, everyone is making a go of increasing archivists who gets to decide what is kept. Part of the reason that uh, people of color don't um, populate the archives in the ways that they should is because who gets to decide what's important to keep and what stories are important to hold over time. And so I'm just really appreciative of both of you because I think there are ways that we can contribute, even in the ways of coming to a program or thinking about how we might take on interns or thinking about whom we hire. That's essential to thinking about how we can also contribute. Also, putting the artwork on our walls, but what can we do to create pathways and trajectories that increase possibility over time for everyone. I like you. <laughs> <laughs> we have other questions from the audience? So thank you um, for your comments. My uh, interest is in, um, there are a lot of people like Rassan was talking about this in prison, creative talents, coming out of prison, creative talents. Uh, but the reality is that certainly there's opportunity for jobs, but the thing that we're lacking is the opportunity for ownership and investment in those positions. So I don't know whether you guys got a board or what, I don't know what more I had got. But one of the things I'm really interested in is how do we put people in uh, places and spaces where they can be influencers of the decisions that's being made? Because I think that it's great that people, you know, got these genuine concerns and interest in uh, helping people that's disadvantaged, incarcerated, what have you. But I think one of the fundamental issues is that people don't really understand the nuances of that. So if you got people that actually have lived those experiences, 
that can come and be in those spaces where people are making those decisions, I think those outcomes of those decisions might be influenced in a different way. So I think that's something else to think about. And that's not just for you, that's for everybody in this room. Yeah. I'm available for board meetings on Wednesdays and Fridays and some weekends. <laughs> Lonnie Morris is available for board meetings on, on Wednesdays and Fridays. Well, I just wanted to add that I, want, I, wanted, I wanted to say in the art world, in the art world, what's really great around, well, you're talking about organizational um, strategies, and one of the things that um, I have served in the capacity often um, is advisory councils. Advisory councils are really powerful parts of arts organizational um, structure. Um, it's community-based. It usually has the most knowledgeable folks there, and they actually are the folks that inspire and give the best ideas to the board. Yeah, so I just mean, when you're seriously thinking about like organizational structures around the arts, those advisory councils are very powerful uh, groups of people. And I just actually wanted to piggyback a little bit on that, and that I know a lot of times people think, well, we, we have to, we can't have someone, if they're like incarcerated, be on our advisory council or on our board. But um, Justice Now was able to do that for like 15 years and have people on our board, um, including one of the artists here, Liz Lozano, was on the Justice Now board for several several years. And um, it was just a process of you know having the board agenda, going inside, talking about the board agenda with them, and taking that information out. So it was a few extra steps, but it's absolutely possible, and I'm just putting that out to the world again. Not like, well, well you have to like, do that, but just like, it's possible, and it just brings brings a, a beautiful voice um, and, and just a lot of good, solid information that you wouldn't have um, if you weren't um, pulling on those resources inside. The resources so, are important. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to be mindful of the time because it is 826. So um, I know. So I'm going to do a closing because um, mimicry is the greatest form of flattery to Laura. And um, to have everyone kind of give us a quick, what's next for you? Oh. <laughs> wow. uh, besides the art expo that Kijo's now coming to, <laughs> Empowerment Avenue is branching into films. We're actually helping uh, uh, incarcerated directors um, bring their film vision to life surrounding it with resources. And in one case, we're helping a guy make a film where he has no access to a media center, no cameras at all by recording his video visits and recording the recording of the video visits. So we're being really innovative on how to include people where there's all these roadblocks. We want to defy gravity. I will be at the opening night of If I Give You My Sorrows. The flyers are in your chairs. I would love to see every person in this room also at the opening or any of the mini shows that are happening um, this next weekend and the following weekend. It is a powerful piece of art and storytelling and it will transform you. Joe Kreider and Fly Away, we actually do transformative art. It makes a difference in people's lives. The stories that we're telling as well as the people that come to witness. So you be in the room. Don't be someone that missed it. That's, where, that's what's next for me. OK, so on Friday, we're opening a new exhibition by Maria Gaspar called Compositions, which is a beautiful, beautiful exhibition that looks at um, Cook County Jail, which is the largest jail in the United States. Recently, the oldest wing of that jail was demolished. And um, the artist who's been working in the jail and in Statesville as well for years and years and years, it has made all of this work around the demolition of this aspect of the jail as what it would happen, what could come from the ruins of a jail other than just newer jails. And it is a really amazing exhibition. The opening's gonna be amazing. Critical Resistance will be there, all sorts of folks. Um, Barrio Sunidos, the, that's gonna be great. We're, there's so many things happening all the time. One of the things that this made me think of is that Michelle Daniel Jones is also coming later in the month. I don't know if you remember who Michelle Daniel Jones is. You know who she is. You might just not remember. <laughs> she was um, uh, incarcerated in the Indiana Women's Correctional Facility and were, was part of a women's history project there. 
applied for graduate school when she was still inside, got into Harvard, they rescinded her uh, acceptance, is now at NYU, has um, published the book that her and all of her collaborators on the inside wrote to tell the history of the Indiana Women's Correctional Institution. But what we've really concentrated on this academic year, which just started like four days ago, because we're on the quarter system, is we're, started, we're really thinking about, we want to bring people in that we can learn from. So, you know, Michelle has done amazing things to get education into the inside, um, to be part of graduate classes while she was in the inside, to bring that to other folks. So we've got, she's the first of many people we have coming to campus to really teach us, um, her and her collaborators, on how to do this work. And y'all should all come hear her talk, or what, we're actually we're gonna be what, live streaming it as well, because they are amazing, so. I keep putting down my microphone because I hate them. Um, well, thank you so much for coming out in this very hot and um, busy evening and um, listening to us. And thank you to our panelists for just being amazing activists, artists, and humans and, um, and sharing that with us tonight. It's been incredible. Sharing, and sharing with us every day, but specifically here in this moment tonight. Thank you. I also want to thank you, Robin, for doing such a masterful job in um, running this panel. So, um, and I can't believe the phone calls worked. So that was exciting. Yeah. Um, I want to thank Empowerment Avenue and Flyaway Productions for partnering with Moad on this uh, online exhibition and the dance performances, which Laura told you all about, and how you all have to go this weekend or next weekend. Um, and we also ask you to join us in insisting on radical prison change. Um, and of course, also take our survey. Um, they're, I know they're not the same level of importance, but, um, and we would, we would really love for you to support the work of Empowerment Avenue, of Flyway Productions, of MOAD, of Critical Resistance, of Visualizing Abolition, of all these organizations that are working to make this change. So thank you all for being here tonight. <laughs>